Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with a very special edition of a Watchman video broadcast. You know, we've been talking about the fourth kingdom now for days, weeks, months, things like that. There was a recurring theme and a recurring idea in every one of the 20 some odd videos, and we're not done with that series yet, the 20 some odd videos that we did concerning the fourth kingdom, there was a symbol that I found in all of my research that was a common link to everything that we had discussed concerning this, this coming fourth kingdom that is going to literally rule all over the earth. That symbol is on the back of the one dollar bill. Now if there's anything that I've learned in almost 50 years of life, I'm, I'm getting there. It's that this little thing right here seems to hold a lot of power on this earth, and it sure does get a lot of interest. That was a joke. But anyway, um, whether it's the U.S. dollar, the British pound, the European euro, the German mark, the Japanese yen, the Mexican peso, it doesn't matter, the Russian ruble, it doesn't matter. People on this earth will do literally anything to get a hold of one or more of these funny little things that we call money. Now, I do not believe that money itself is evil. If I believe that, I would not have carried this around in my wallet all morning. Uh, but I do believe the scriptures that says the love of money is the root of all evil. And in this particular ministry that God has given us, we like to uncover the root of things. We like to get right down to it and find out what is the source of the problem. With this particular form of currency, there is on the back of the one dollar bill some very interesting symbols. Now this is the symbol, the all-seeing eye, that we have been seeing over and over and over in our study on the fourth kingdom. There are actually two parts to the great seal of the United States of America, and that's literally what uh, these two circles are, one represents the front of the seal, the other was, represents the back of the seal. Incidentally, and we're going to look at some of the history of the great seal uh, a little bit later on. Incidentally, I found out that most people, including most politicians, most government people, did not know what was on the back of the great seal of the United States of America. They only knew the front, they only knew the eagle part, but they didn't know that. One man in particular decided he liked it so much, he told Franklin Delano Roosevelt, let's put that on every one dollar bill that comes out in America. That was in the 1930s, and we're still doing it. We're going to take a look at, in this series, what the great seal of the United States represents. Now, I understand that many documentaries Many books have been written, many web logs, I've looked at a few of them, YouTube videos, have tried to tell you or try to analyze what this is all about, what it means. We're going to do that, we're going to take it a little bit further than what probably most people have decided to do. We're actually going to go to the source or the root of what these symbols are. Now, if you look at them, you'll see that practically every element or every part of the two faces of this seal are symbolic. I mean, we have an eagle, we've got stars, we've got olive branches and arrows, we've got this funny looking pyramid. Everything on here is a symbol and symbols always represent something. We're gonna look at the language of symbolism in, in a little bit. And even the, the writing that's on here, you have very few words in English. In fact, you have the great seal of the United States written across the bottom of both of them. But then you have some Latin words in here, e pluribus unum, anuit queptus, novus ordo seclorum. Those are Latin. What do they mean and what significance do they take on, including, I found out, even the spelling of some of these Latin words has somewhat of an importance. And we're going to break that down. We're going to look at the, like I said, we're going to look at the eagle, the pyramid, e pluribus unum, we're going to look at all of those things. And the first place that we're going to look is someone who spent all of his life 
trying to uncover and learn as much as he possibly could about a great secret that exists on planet Earth that has existed for years and years and years gone by. Manley Palmer Hall wrote a book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And Man what Manley Hall did, I did a little research on him. It seems like in his mid-20s, he became the recipient because of some of the organizations that he belonged to, a certain church, quote-unquote, in California. He became the beneficiary of a large sum of money. This sum of money enabled him to literally go around the world, observe, take notes on, find sacred, long-forgotten manuscripts and texts to add to part of his archive and part of his collection, to which he probably read practically every one of them. So Manley Hall takes in the secret teachings of all ages, he takes all of the things that he's learned over the years, all of the mystery religions, all of the pagan rituals, all of the uh, philosophical ideas that have existed all throughout history, and it didn't matter what part of the world they came from, he grouped them all together into what he originally referred to as a, an encyclopedia of mysticism. We now know it as the secret teachings of all ages. And here's what Manley Hall said about the idea behind symbolism. What, what is, when we see this pyramid with the all-seeing eye on it, emblazoned in glory, and we understand that it is a left eye. What does that mean? So here's what Manley Hall said about symbolism. Symbolism is the language of the mysteries. In fact, it is the language not only of mysticism and philosophy, but of all of nature. For every law and power active in universal procedure is manifested to the limited sense perceptions of man through the medium of symbol. By symbols men have ever sought to communicate to each other those thoughts which transcend the limitations of language. Rejecting man-conceived dialects as inadequate and unworthy to perpetuate divine ideas, the mysteries thus chose symbolism as a far more ingenious and ideal method of preserving their transcendental knowledge. In a single figure, a symbol may both reveal and conceal. For to the wise, the subject of the symbol is obvious, while to the ignorant, the figure remains inscrutable. Hence... He who seeks to unveil the secret doctrine of antiquity must search for that doctrine not upon the open pages of books which might fall into the hands of the unworthy, but in the place where it was originally concealed. Now let me back up here. Let me explain to you exactly what he is saying. He is saying that, human, that there is a, a divine secret, a secret from, let's say, a god or the gods. There is a divine secret. Now where, where did Manley Hall get that from? We're going to go to the source of what I believe is the understanding of every symbol that there is out there. The Holy Bible. The book of Genesis, the very first words out of the serpent's mouth in Genesis chapter 3, Yea, hath God said. And then he said, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye have, uh, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It seems to me that the first entity that ever introduced a mystery concept or a secret from a god or the gods was none other than Lucifer himself. So now we have a connection between some very large secret and who was responsible for perpetrating that secret and that mystery on mankind. He said that the, um, those who were studying the mysteries, they chose symbolism uh, as a method of preserving their transcendental knowledge. Now, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at these symbols here that are on the back of the $1 bill, the Great Seal, and we're going to try to discern what it is that these symbols are saying. Now, you might already in your mind say, well, you know, I've seen this documentary, I've seen, I've read that book. Uh, Dan Brown refers to it a little bit in The Lost Symbol. There is a connection between symbolism and this symbolism and a group known as the Free and Accepted Masons. Albert Pike, referred to as the grandfather of Freemasonry, United States of America, wrote very, very large book, 800 and some odd pages, 
on morals and dogma, and he did exactly what Manley Hall referred to in this last part of his, uh, of his saying was, was that you can read all of these open books, but the truth is no one wrote the secret down. No one wrote exactly what these symbols refer to or what they mean. And I can tell you, I've read most of Manley Hall's book. I've read most of Morals and Dogma. And I can tell you that for the most part, they didn't write the real understanding of the symbolism of Freemasonry or the mystery cults. They didn't write it down anywhere. The, uh, Masonic lodges all across the world, some of them hold uh, large repositories of sacred, semi-sacred, occult, mystical books, books on philosophy and things like that, and they don't mind that you read most of them, or maybe even all of them. Because the truth of it is, they didn't write the secret of what these symbols mean. And I think that there is a commonality amongst all symbols in the world, or the language of symbolism itself, preserves and seals in, seal, think about that, a secret knowledge that only a few people, according to them, could ever understand. I disagree with that. I think there is a source of understanding this, these symbols, and I think God offers it openly to every man, woman, and child who listen. That's where we're headed as we look at what these symbols represent. Now, there is a theory that the language of symbolism itself goes all the way back to the story of the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11, you have the, the revelation of something that took place right after the flood. You have all of the peoples of the world. Granted, there probably wasn't billions and billions of them at that time that had been produced by the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah. And they were collected all into one place in the valley of Shinar, or as some people refer to it as Sumer or Sumeria. They were all gathered together, and they had an idea that they wanted to elevate themselves to a higher level. So they said, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Of course, God seeing this, knowing that he has already provided for mankind's ascendancy into immortality or eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ, he's not happy with what they're doing. So he said, let's go and confuse and confound their languages so they cannot accomplish their goal because mankind has a very wild imagination and it will get to a point that whatever man imagines, he will be able to do. And I can tell you, we're living in times very, very similar to that if they have not already exceeded that of the days of Babel. We're living in those times right now. But here's what happened. They were all gathered together. Everyone spoke the same language. And they were all in happy harmony. And God went down and confused their languages. So now they have to segregate. Now they have to come apart. Now they cannot all be in one little happy place here because this person is speaking one thing and this person is speaking another. And they cannot communicate easily one with another. So here's this theory, and I, I think I like it. I think it's true that the certain people at that time who were the custodians of a very large secret decided since they cannot speak the same language and understand one another, they decided to start using the language of symbolism so that when one person in one part of the world sees a symbol like the unfinished pyramid coming from something in another part of the world if they had been indoctrinated into the mysteries and given a certain knowledge of these secrets, then they would understand exactly what this means or at least understand what they were told this means. Because here's one of the things that Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma, and I'm going to paraphrase. Albert Pike said to all you Masons out there who joined the Lodge, hoorah, we're, we're proud of you. But here's the thing. You're going to enact a ritual called the death of Hiram Abiff, and he's going to be raised to life again with the grip of the lion's paw. 
And we're going to show you all kinds of symbols and give you secret names, secret codes, secret handshakes, secret hand gestures, secret symbols, and so on. Al or, yeah, Albert Pike basically said, if we told you what they meant, we were lying. We were not telling you the truth. We deliberately misled you, just like we have deliberately misled millions of people throughout the span of time. There is, and Albert Pike basically is saying, there is no way in the world we're going to tell anybody but a very select few exactly what these symbols mean. So should we, like those at the Tower of Babel, walk around in darkness with no understanding whatsoever of the things that are going on, literally right in front of their very eyes? Because, I mean, here's my premise here. There is a secret that is in this world that those who hold this secret will stop at nothing to keep this secret from being revealed. They have hidden this secret inside of various symbols. And every time someone pulls out a dollar bill at McDonald's or at the grocery store or at Walmart or to get on the train, every time we pull out one of these dollar bills, we see this secret but most people don't understand what it is. They have no clue what this is. And those that are part of the mystery schools are very confident in the fact that most people will never find out what these symbols mean. Now, here's what I found out. Even though that Pike and Manley Hall and scores, maybe even hundreds or thousands of others, We'll try to tell you that there is no real way that you can uncover this secret nor find out what these symbols mean. There is actually a very definitive source for understanding what all of these symbols, what does this eagle mean, what does this all-seeing eye mean, what does e pluribus unum, what does it really represent? There is, in fact, one source that those in the mystery schools repeatedly say everybody who has ever read this book doesn't understand the true nature of its revelation. And I'll give you a little clue. Some of you already figured it out. If you've ever gone into a Masonic Lodge, I've been in the uh, House of the Lodge Temple, the Mother Lodge in Washington, D.C. If you've ever been to a Masonic, and they have actually two lodge rooms. One is the great meeting place that you might have seen on television, some of the documentaries, uh, or some pictures I've taken. Or there is a secondary meeting place for the, some of the hierarchy, some of the higher ranking Freemasons that are part of that lodge. When you walk in there, you find that there is an altar there. And on that altar, there's a book. It's this book. It's the King James Bible. Usually, they'll put the Masonic emblem of the square and compass right on top of that Bible. Now, here's what Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma concerning the symbolism of this one particular book being on the altar with the square and compass on it. He said, for the master, the compass of faith is above the square of reason, but both rest upon the holy scriptures and combine to form the blazing star of truth. Now, I won't get into all what all the blazing star is just yet, but understand what Pike was saying. By the mere fact that you walk into a lodge, you see a King James Bible there, and a square and compass resting on it, that in itself is a symbol. I have found out that Masons don't even cross their legs without it being a symbol of something. And it is. You'll see pictures of Masons with their legs crossed. Why? It represents something. Why do they wear the apron? Why do they wear the, the hats? Why do they have secret handshakes? And what do those secret handshakes and gestures mean? Why do they have secret passwords and code words? What do they mean? Everything that Masons do has some sort of symbol attached to it, and there is the, the exoteric meaning of that symbol, which is that's what we tell everybody else it means. There is the esoteric meaning. In other words, it has two meanings. The esoteric is the secret meaning that no one can ever find out about. So if you're a Mason, you're someone who has been in the lodge and you saw the square and compass on the Bible, and they told you, well, that means, you know, that you know, we regard the sacred scriptures or this. or They told you any kind of thing. They didn't tell you the truth. Here's what the idea is. And this is what Pike said. He said, the holy scriptures 
along with the square and compass, are the blazing star of truth. And what they're saying is, there is a secret that this square and compass is trying to seal in so that no one knows it. But the place that they're sealing, it's not morals and dogma, it's not Dan Brown's book, it's not anything else. It's the King James Bible. Here's another one. This is from a book called The Masonic Ladder, written in 1866. The author said the Bible is full of Masonic secrets to the initiated. Here's another ancient Masonic text from 1863 called The Ignorant Learned. The great Masonic truths concealed among the learned of former ages under allegories and fables are therefore lost, long, long lost. But what is lost is not consequently destroyed. What is lost may be found, and all that is required is some clue or key. Fortunately, there are applicable keys held sacred by a body of men who know not their use, and the locks these keys fit are held sacred by all modern clergy and the multitude of religionists. The first and best evidence of the truthfulness of the keys is their being used to interpret the Bible, that heavenly book of truth. And so we have multiple sources now. Uh, Manley Hall refers to it. Albert Pike talks about it. Other Masonic authors have referred to this Bible as being the key that unlocks all of the secrets and all of the symbols. And I can tell you that spending years looking, reading all of these books, trying to find out what the secret was, it dawned on me that there was actually a place where all of the secrets are going to be revealed. And that place is the Holy Scriptures, the King James Bible, the Word of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29, here's what God said. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. God does have a secret, but He then it plainly explains exactly what those secrets are. Here's an interesting word to look up in the Bible. It's the word mystery. You'll find it only in the New Testament of the King James Bible. In every place that the word mystery is used, you'll find that God is going to explain the mystery. Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all, but we we'll all shall, shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Paul is revealing a secret. He's revealing a mystery. There is a harlot woman in Revelation chapter 17 whose first name is Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's 13 words. You think about that in relation to about 10 or so things that are on the back of the one dollar bill. And we're going to look at those in time. But the idea of the mystery, God is the one who reveals all of the secrets and all of the mysteries. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, the Bible also teaches us that when we read the New Testament, we understand that there was a secret thing in the Old Testament. And that secret thing, of course, was Jesus Christ. Now he's being made manifest to all the world and the mysteries over. Let me do something by, by way of comparison here. When masons gather together in their lodge, at a certain level, they whisper into your ear a secret name for God, Jabul On, which is not really God's real name. That's a fusion of three different gods. Anyway, um, and then whisper it in your ear, and then they tell you, don't tell anybody. If you do, we'll slit your throat from ear to ear. How's that sound? Oh, well, I won't tell anybody. And so by and large... They don't tell anybody. They don't even tell their wives what goes on in the lodge. Now let me give you the contrast. Jesus taught his disciples many things. And he told them and he said, What I speak into your ear, you proclaim from the rooftops. You go tell everybody what I said and reveal to them the mystery. Because Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is the revealer of all of the secrets. Matthew chapter 13, verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. Let me stop right here. A parable, you know what a parable is? It is a story that has symbolic meaning. 
In other words, we have um, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We have the story of the, um, the sower and the seed. A sower went forth to sow seed in the field, just like you would see a guy or a farm implement or whatever planting seed in the ground. Jesus then takes his disciples and he explains to them exactly what the symbols mean. The seed is the word of God. The sower goes forth and the, these are stony ground. People are hard hearts. Here's thorns here. People with a lot of sins and here's good ground. This is, the, what, this is what God can work with. And so he explains all of the secrets. Even though he speaks in parables, he's giving you a, number one, a symbol of what that doctrine looks like. But number two, he himself is going to explain what the symbols mean. He's not going to just leave it up to you to figure it out. He's actually going to teach it to you. So he says, he spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable speaking not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Mark chapter 4, verse 22, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. And so here we have the Bible teaching us that everything that all of these think should be kept a secret, and they can't be revealed, they can't be discussed, they can't be talked about. It even says on the front of uh, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, esoteric book for Scottish Rite use only. In other words, they didn't want this book falling into the hands of people who were not ish initiated into masonry. They didn't want anybody to have this. It's a secret. They're trying to keep it sealed. Thus, the symbolism of the square and compass on top of the Holy Bible, that's like putting your finger to your lips, which is a universal symbol for shut up. The Bible actually refers to the lips as a door, the door of the lips. Keep the door of my lips. Here's the lock over the lips. It's the square and compass on top of the Bible. Shh. Don't tell anybody what you find out in here. Well, I believe that Jesus is the one who opens all of the doors. And we're going to find out from the scriptures exactly what all of these symbols represent. Now, we note that, and give you a little background here, this is not just a decoration on a form of currency. This is actually what is referred to as the great seal of the United States of America. We're going to get into some of the history of this seal and how it came about a little bit later on. But we're going to understand exactly what, what and why a seal can be used. If you've, ever, um, if you've ever been part of a transaction where you had to have a notary public um, notarize a document, you'll note that that notary public has a seal. They have a device that can crimp the paper and put a watermark on there or something like that. And that is basically a representation that this particular document is authentic. You might remember back in the old days, we've got to where we just lick envelopes now. Ugh, I hate it. They can at least make it taste like peppermint or something like that. But you, uh, you lick envelopes now. But back then, especially when a royal decree went forth or a royal letter went from one king or one monarch to another, they would write the letter out, close it up, take sealing wax, drop it down on there, the king would take his ring and stick it on there and mash it in there, and that was a sign that no one was to read this letter or that it's to be preserved until it gets to the person it's going to, and it's by order of the king. So we understand a little bit about what seals do. The Secretary of the State of the United States of America has custody of the great seal of the United States of America and actually uses this seal for very, very important documents. There is a version of this, which is the seal of the President of the United States. He uses it on coffee mugs and it's on the podium that he stands on. That, rep that symbol represents his power, his authority to declare certain things to be the way they are. It is by the mouth of the President of the United States to call upon all of the armed forces of America and say, go to war. 
this is what I said. That seal gives him his power and his authority. So we kind of understand a little bit about what seals represent. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to go line upon line, precept upon precept in the scriptures. We're going to let the scriptures tell us what would be the possible use of the symbols and the emblems that emblazon the great seal of the United States of America. In other words, what will it do or what can it do? We're going to find out from the scriptures and then we're going to find out by analyzing each of the symbols that are on the back of this one dollar bill, we're going to find out from the scriptures exactly what these emblems both represent now and what they have in store. So let's go to the scriptures. Let's understand the biblical significance of a seal. What I did was I typed in, we have some software if you want it, called Pure Bible Search Software, purebiblesearch.com. Download it free of charge don't charge anything, and you take and you type in the word seal or any variant of seal. I, I like to type in S-E-A-L and an asterisk, and that gives me sealed, sealing, or anything like that. It gives me all the variants, all right? What I did was I went through the scriptures, and I began to categorize each use of the word seal and how it was used and how it was represented. And what you'll see is that the Bible gives a clear definition of exactly what a seal represents. First thing is, a seal is used by governments to show authority or force of law or a treaty. Now let's go to the scriptures and find out. First Kings 21, 7. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. Now, if you go read the rest of the story, you'll understand that no one defied the letter that went forth, even though Naboth, or excuse me, Ahab didn't write it. His wife, Jezebel, wrote it. And she took his seal and sealed that letter with his mark or his whatever it was. That it, it, now, if Jezebel would have written this letter and said, signed Jezebel, and hung it out in the streets. Everybody's going, I ain't going to that. That's stupid. That's, that woman's a Jezebel. I don't want anything to do with her. She didn't have the authority. She couldn't have got the crowd. She had to use the authority that a seal represents. Now, there is something, there's an aspect of this, and I'm going to bring into here, because I think this verse is telling us something about what this represents. It's the idea that Naboth had a vineyard. There's all kinds of The idea of a vineyard itself is symbolic in the Bible. The Bible will tell you what it means. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The vineyard is the house of God or a family or uh, a group of people who uh, follow after a certain idea, a certain philosophical idea or a certain religion. And, Jesus, and here's Naboth and he has this inheritance of a vineyard and he's going to hand it down to his children. And Ahab wants to buy it, and Naboth cannot sell it to him because the law forbids him to sell it to him. So Jezebel concocts a plan to get the vineyard. Think of things that wrap around poles. That's what vines are, like two serpents on a pole. Think about that. Think about what that vineyard then could possibly represent. And it belongs to you. And Jezebel's job is to get that vineyard into the hands of her very evil husband. And she uses the seal to do it. We're going to look into that as we move on. Esther chapter 3 verse 12, Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written to, according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, and to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to the, every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written, and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day, 
of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, to take the spoil of them for a prey. This is from the book of Esther. And Haman, who was the wicked counselor to King Ahasuerus, he hated God's people. So he wanted an order written up that on a certain day, the 13th day, think about it, the 13th day, all the Jews were to be killed, all in one day. So he took the king's ring and used that to seal and to put that into effect. In other words, it had the force of the king's decree by way of the seal. So in this case here, the seal has a very evil, sinister plan and design to it. And it's going to use the force of power to get it accomplished. Now, uh, this, the conspiracy eventually is found out in the book of Esther. King Ahasuerus realizes that when they decide to kill all the Jews, they're going to kill his wife, Esther, who was also a Jew. So he uncovers the plot that Haman was going to kill all of the Jews, including his wife. And he said, we're not going to do this. He ordered Haman hanged on the gallows. And he took his ring with his seal on it that bore his authority, that mark of authority. He gave it to Mordecai, the Jew who comes riding in on a white horse. Think about that. All right, here's what the Bible says. Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write you also for the Jews, as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name, and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. Esther 8, verse 12. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely the th upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. Here's the interesting thing I, that I see about this, is that once the king's mark, think about the wording I'm using here, once the king's mark and his seal was used upon a law or a document, it was irreversible. You can't change it. You can't alter it. Once the king seals it with his ring, it has to happen, and there's no way to change it. I want you to think of something in Revelation 13 that has to do with a mark upon people's right hand or their forehead, and God says everyone who takes that mark I'm going to cast them into the lake of fire. There's no, and there's no reversing it. Once you choose to take this mark, and I believe it's going to be a choice, once you choose to take this mark, that's how it's going to be, and there's no repentance, and there's no turning back. That's the effect that the king's seal has. Daniel 6, 17, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Dan. You know that story, don't you? Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel was guilty of the sin of what? Praying three times a day. And by the way, it didn't bother him that, they, that the government found out. Some of you people, quit hiding. Quit hiding your views. Quit hiding your ideas. And you think that, oh, the government's listening, and I'm scared. They might come to the black helicopters, take me away. So what? If you truly believe what you say you believe, and you're ready to die for it, doesn't matter who hears it. Let them hear it, all right? But anyway, Daniel prayed, and he didn't do it in secret. He went and stood before the window, and he prayed. And they caught him because they were trying to set him up because they were trying to kill God's people, especially Daniel. They hated him. So they, the king had already written a decree that anybody who's praying to any other god except um, the king's god had to be thrown into the lion's den. And here's the funny part. The order didn't say they had to die in there. It just said it had to be thrown in there. So the king, even though he didn't want to do this, he said, I've set this to my seal. I have to do this. This is the law of the Medes and Persians. Once it goes into effect, we can't reverse, not even I can reverse it. The law has force. So they took Daniel, put a stone in front of that, over the, the den's mouth, and then they took his ring and the Lord's ring, and they sealed it to make sure that nothing was going to tamper with that stone. It had the force and the authority of the king's seal, like this does. 
And sure enough, Daniel survived. Why? Because God can shut the mouths of lions if he wants to. So that's the idea behind a seal, is that it bears the force and the authority of, let's say, a government or a king. Matthew 27, 64. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. The stone rolled in front of Christ's tomb, and they put the government's seal on it to make sure that no one broke through the Caesar's commandment or Pontius Pilate's commandment. In other words, it had the force and the authority of the king. Revelation 20, verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key in the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand, and laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Now, here's where we're going to start getting it interesting, all right? We know, we, I believe the Bible. An angel is going to come and wrap Satan, Lucifer the dragon, in chains and cast him into the bottomless pit. And then he's going to set a seal on it, which shows the authority and the force of Almighty God and that for a thousand years, that seal is not going to be loosed. So now we, we sort of see here a, a mixing of two ideas that a seal represents. Number one, it represents the force of authority or the force of a king. And that nothing can change it. But it also represents the idea that a seal, there is something behind the seal. There's something that is sealed in that cannot get out as long as the king says, but then one day the king can say, open the seal, break the seal, loose the seal, and let him out one more time. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So now we have sort of the mixture of the two ideas. Now, here's another thing a seal represents. Seals are used to show binding consent as in a contract. A notary seal shows that parties to a contract have been legally identified. Let's go to the scriptures with that concept in mind. In other words, it's, a, it's an official document. It has a seal on it. And a se here's what you do. When you sign a contract, you are placing your mark on that contract that is exclusive to you. Apparently, nobody else in the world signs their name exactly the way you do. Even if you have 40 guys named John Smith, when they all sit down and sign their name on something, no two of those signatures are going to be alike. That is your seal. And when you sign a contract, you are sealing and binding yourself to the terms of that covenant or that contract. Now think of, think of the old covenant, the old contract, Mount Sinai. When God delivered the Ten Commandments, the Israelites gave their consent that this was going to be the rule over them. The problem is the rule, God's law, required that they faithfully obey every instruction that God gave them. They didn't do it. You haven't done it. I haven't done it either. So now we have a new covenant, a new contract, and it is sealed by the Holy Ghost himself. But it becomes in force between two parties because both parties give their consent and their seal to be bound by that contract. Now, there is a contract out there, and God mentioned it to Israel. He said, you have made a covenant with death and hell that's who you're in agreement with. And I believe that there's coming a time when people will literally give consent and the binding force of their seal to follow after a covenant with death and hell. And I think it has everything to do with the mark of the beast, which is literally his seal. Nehemiah chapter 9. 
Now, on the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up there in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Then in verse 38, and because of all of this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. In other words, these people have been brought back from Babylonian captivity. They were read the covenant of God that God gave them at Mount Sinai. This is a much later generation that was there than at Mount Sinai. When they come back into God's land, they said, God, we want to please you. We don't ever want this to ever to happen again. And so, God, we're going to take this covenant that you make with us this day, and we're going to set our seal upon it so that that binds both you and us into the terms of this contract. And they were all in agreement to it. Romans chapter 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet, being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And here's the Bible's teaching us very simple things, that Abraham did not get circumcised first, and then God gave him his approval and, and imputed his righteousness to him. Abraham believed God, and God had already imputed righteousness to him, and then he was given the seal. Abraham was given the seal and the sign and the binding force that says, Abraham, you are going to live forever and have eternal life. And what was that sign? What was that seal? It was circumcision. The cutting off of the foreskin and casting it away. That's a picture of us when we die. Our flesh rots off, it corrupts, and we walk in newness of life. We have a new resurrection body. That's what that represents. By the way, circumcision is irreversible. And I would just, I don't want to be vulgar or mean, but that's exactly what it is. Once that is sealed, it is an irreversible seal. It's a sign of the covenant, the contract. 2 Corinthians 1, 20, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. I like this one. This is one of my favorite places in the Bible. When God truly saves and gives the born-again promise to a rotten, filthy, dirty, lousy sinner like me and you, to those that are truly, biblically born again, he gives them the seal of the Holy Spirit. It's like signing the contract. And then he says, it's the earnest of our inheritance. You know what that is, don't you? We use this in what we call earnest money. You put up your car for sale. Put it on Craigslist. Guy sees it, comes by your house. Ooh, sweet ride. I like that car. He likes the car. What do you want for it? Well, I want 4500 How about 4000 Uh No, how about 4200 Okay, how about 4100 All right, it's a deal. So the two come to an agreement, and the, and the guy who's going to buy it says, Now look, I do have to go to the bank and get this money out. Here is $100. That's quite a bit of money. Here is $100. I'm going to give that to you. You hold that car for me. Don't sell it out from underneath me. Don't give it away. Don't go out and wreck it. You hold that car for me and hang on to it. I'm going to give you my earnest. I'm telling you by way of me giving you something that is of great value to me, you hold on to that as the earnest that I am going to do exactly what I said I was going to do. We've entered into a contract, an agreement. I'm going to pay you $4,100. You're going to give me the car and the title to a car, which is what? It's sealed, isn't it? When you get the title to a car or a house or anything like that, it's the document then becomes sealed. 
and it's of binding force. I don't care if it's a $100,000 automobile. This piece of paper with this writing on it says that this car belongs to this man here and no one else in the whole world can do anything about it. It's sealing the idea of a contract or a covenant and it's putting it in binding force so that both parties are bound and earnest is given, bound by the covenant. God offers us the covenant, the New Testament, of eternal life. And as a sign and a seal to us that God did, in fact, authorize that covenant to be used, that if we believe God, He will give us righteousness and we'll go to heaven. God then says, I'm going to give you something of great value to me. I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is going to be the seal of my earnestness and I'm going to give him I'm going to give you her earnest money to show you that one of these days I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you what I promised to give you that is one of my favorite places in the whole Bible is that God gave us an earnest of the Holy Spirit which is the seal that both you and I who are truly born again are going to have the inheritance that God has laid back for his children now Seals also denote secrecy. Seal documents or records that are not for public viewing or knowledge for a period of time. Um, court cases where someone, a, a young man, 20, 22 years old, is being arrested and he's committed a certain crime. Did he commit these crimes in the past? Yes. They want to go back and look at his records when he was 16, 17 years old. And the court says, no, you cannot look at these. They're sealed. No one can know what's in these records. JFK. There is who knows how many documents somewhere in Washington DC at the Smithsonian, at an Air Force base in Area 51, who knows where they are. There is an untold number of documents that by law are sealed and no one can go in and see them and find out what's on these documents until a certain time. Then, and they, the government figures, yeah, all of the people who really did it, after like 2074 or whatever, then these documents can be released because this person is going to be long dead and it's not going to have anything to do with them. So maybe in a hundred or a thousand years we'll unseal all the documents, but that's the idea behind a seal, is that it hides something in secrecy, usually until an appointed time. Let's go to the scripture. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. He says it again in Daniel 12, 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now here's what God did. I like this. Here's what God did. We have in this Bible the 27th book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Daniel. This is interesting. Here we have the 27th book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. I get it. This book has elements of it that are sealed. That's what he was saying here. Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So there is going to come a time when the things that are sealed in the book of Daniel are going to be unsealed in the last day. Think of some place in the book of Revelation where a seal is loosed. You go read that because it has everything to do with not only just the idea of the seals in the scriptures, but it has everything to do with what's on the back of the one dollar bill and the great seal. There are secrets, and all of these people are in agreement. There are secrets that these symbols represent that, according to them, have to remain hidden until a certain time. And no one is supposed to know what this eye is and what this pyramid represents and what Anuit Coeptus really means and what E Pluribus Unum, what is the goal of turning many into one. What is the goal here? That's what a seal 
represents. There's something secret. It's a document. It's an idea. It's a word. The law symbol. Dan Brown finds out that, and the person in this book, uh, Robert Langdon, finds out that buried underneath Washington's monument is a book. What book is it? This one. And that Masonic symbol is so powerful that the Masons themselves have to keep the secret of the symbolism of why a King James Bible is buried in a secret chamber underneath as, as sort of the uh, foundation stone of Washington's monument. That seal is secret and that idea is secret but there is going to come a time when it's going to be unsealed. It's going to be released. It's going to be known. Here's another one. Revelation 10.4. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, I have a little theory that says that I think that whatever God says is in fact written down. I just don't think that this particular thing that the seven thunders uttered were ever written by John. But I do think they were written by somebody else. And I think there's going to come a time when even the words of the seven thunders that are sealed right now are going to be unsealed at a future date. And then we have the idea of a seal, something that is preserved for a certain time. You've, you've heard of time capsules, haven't you? They take various items that have some... Th there was just a time capsule open, I think, in Apple, something to do with Apple computers. And they had various things that Apple had put out years ago, and they now they opened up the, the time capsule. Now they've unsealed the capsule. And so now these things can come out. I, the, the idea of a seal is that you're holding something in or you're preserving something for a certain specified time. And then, you're going to let it out. So I want you to think about that. We're going, to, we're going to take our time and go through this study. We're going to look at each one of these symbols. But then I want you to understand it. We're going to keep going back to these scriptures. But the idea is, is that there is something about this that is reserved for a certain day and a certain time and a certain season in the future. Let's look at the scriptures. Deuteronomy 32, 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? God is teaching us the difference between the rock of Jesus Christ, the rock of the word of God, and the rock of mystery religions. He said their rock is not as our rock. Our rock is out there for everybody to see. Their rock is hidden. They have a, they have a hidden secret. Their vine is not the vine of Jesus and the pure new wine of the Holy Spirit. Their vine is the vine of Sodom and it's bitter and it makes people drunk. And he said, is not this laid up in store and sealed up among my treasures. So there is a secret here, a lost word, a, the poison of a dragon that's going to come out. Think of something being poisoned in Revelation chapter 9. Think of what these scorpions do in Revelation 9. There is a poison that God has laid up in store for a specified time. And for right now, it's sealed in. And we're not going to let it out yet. Song of Solomon 8.6 Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals are of our coals of fire with a most vehement flame. Set me as a seal upon thy heart, and as a seal upon thine arm. In other words, this is something that is preserved. The love that Christ has for his church, the love that the church, the bride has for Christ, that love is sealed up and reserved 
for a certain time in the future. Isaiah 8, 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. In other words, there is a covenant, there is a promise, there is the testimony of God that is bound and sealed amongst God's disciples. And the Bible says God's people will wait for it to be unsealed one of these days. Think Revelation chapter 5. Jeremiah 32, 13. And I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may continue many days. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. And I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and put it together. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. I love this one. I, this is one of my favorite things to talk about in the Bible. It, God was about to take the last two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, he was about to put them into Babylonian captivity. But he wanted them to understand that at some point in a future date, he was going to give them their land back. He was going to give them the inheritance that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he promised Abraham that his seed would possess that. And so... God sent Jeremiah to go buy a property from his uncle. He had the right to redeem it according to the law. It wasn't doing what Ahab did with Naboth in his vineyard. This, his uncle Hanamiel, did, or his uncle's son, did not want this property anymore. And, and Jeremiah, as a near kinsman, had the biblical right to purchase it from him. So he purchased it, gave him 17 shekels of silver, and he took the copy, the land coordinates. It's this rock and this tree over by this creek and over this fence over here. And they had two copies of it. One of them was sealed. One of them was open. Think Daniel and Revelation. One of them was sealed. And they took the copies, both of them, and they put them in an earthen vessel. They sealed them, put them in an earthen vessel, because God said, one of these days, I want my people to know that they can have their houses and their lands and their vineyards back. I'm going to let them have it. And so I'm going to take the covenant and the promise and I'm going to seal it up and I'm going to store it in an earthen vessel. And one of these days, we're going to go, we're going to open that vessel, we're going to find that sealed book, we're going to break the seals, it's going to be opened up and now it's going to be in force. God's going to give His people their inheritance back. And Paul said, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these two absolutely are tied together. We have this treasure. Old Testament, sealed, book of Daniel, New Testament, Revelation, open. They're both sealed and revealed. Sealed up in an earthen vessel. And one of these days, God's going to break the clay break the seal. And by the way, only Jesus is authorized to open the seals. Why? It was his seal. He's the only one authorized to do it. Ephesians 1.12 That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There it is again. That's the earnest to us. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. That's exactly what went on in Jeremiah chapter 32. There was a purchased possession, and it was sealed up, and God gave us the earnest that one of these days the seals are going to be broken, and that promise is going to be given to His people Israel. Now, I think that this seal represents a different lot, a different inheritance, a different wage, as it were. It also is sealed up and will be in force at the time of the end. Ezekiel 28, 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You know who this is talking about? At the beginning of Ezekiel 28, it mentions the king of Tyrus. 
And he says, uh, here's what you said. I am God. I sit in the seat of God. We know from Isaiah 14 that Lucifer wants to be like the Most High. He wants to sit on God's throne and rule and reign. 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin, the son of perdition, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so remember, we have the earnest of the inheritance of the people of Israel sealed up and hid in an earthen vessel. That's who we are. We're the earthen vessel. God is preserving his promises and sealing them in us so they can't be corrupted. That's the, that's the next one I'm going to get into. But think likewise. In fact, Dan Brown actually used that symbolism on the front cover of the lost symbol. There's a seal here with a sacred, quote-unquote, emblem that shows that something is sealed up and it's hidden, and it's going to be opened up and revealed in the time of the end. And who is it that has that seal? The king of Tyrus, Lucifer himself, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Just as you and I are sealed in the Holy Spirit, and sealed up as an eternal inheritance for and from God, the peoples of this earth who walk in sin. Sin always has a sum. It always has the total of everything. If you remember in uh, the Matrix series, when Neo was standing before the architect, Neo was referred to as the one because he was the sum of a remainder of of a nearly perfect equation. It was out of balance just a little bit, and all of the leftover fragments, they added together to make the sum of those remainders, and that sum was referred to as the one. And the one, of course, is another picture of the Antichrist. And so here, Lucifer, all of those who are in Christ are sealed, just like Noah being in the ark and God shut the door. He sealed him in. You know, by sealing Noah in, he sealed everyone else out. And just as you and I are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, all of the wickedness in the world is going to be sealed up by none other Lucifer than himself. He's gonna, they're going to have his spirit in them, just like Lucifer or Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. And once he did that, Judas is done. There's no redemption, no salvation for Judas whatsoever. He ends up doing exactly what God said happens to cursed people. He hung himself. Cursed is anyone that hanged from a tree. And so Lucifer is the sum of, of all iniquity in the world, and he seals up that sum in the hearts of all people of mankind. Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible calls him the, um, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So there is a seal of the Holy Spirit, which is the word of God, the earnest of the inheritance. There is also a seal of the devil, and Lucifer is the sum of that seal. I want you to look at a, a graphic now of the great seal. This is on the reverse side of the seal. Notice that you have all these stones, and these stones all add up and make the sum so that there can be something else as a part of that. That's the all-seeing eye. We're going to get to more of that as we continue this study, but I, I want you to kind of follow me on this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, 29. Let no corrupt communication come, proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So here again we see the idea that God's people are sealed up unto a certain day, and I believe Lucifer's people are also sealed up for a specific day and a specific time. It's like taking something, put it in a jar, seal it up, put it in a closet, and forget about it until such a day as it's ready to happen. Then you take it out, open it up. Here it is. Some people should do that with their credit cards, by the way. It'd be a good idea. Then we have, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about today. The idea of, of sealing 
represents preservation from corruption or destruction. How many of you, you helped your mom and dad can vegetables? That's, that's what we did in the summertime. Dad planted a big garden. None of it went to waste. We took peas, beans, okra, tomatoes, anything that my dad can plant, we took it. And uh, what we didn't eat at that time, I can remember helping my mom put food in jars and put that little lid on top of it, put it in boiling water, and what that would do, that would cause a vacuum inside of that jar, and it, that jar, that lid would seal all of that good stuff inside that jar, and that stuff could stay in there for years without ever having any corruption or any destruction. I like this one. This is, this is one of my favorites, all right? Watch this. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. I want you to notice that they sealed the vision and the prophecy. Why? It's just like why uh, Jeremiah took a copy of the, of the sealed land deed and put it in an earthen vessel and covered it. Even if you lost the original that was out there and, and Jeremiah could say, I have this property, it's mine, here's the deed to it right here. Even if that copy was destroyed, he knew that he had the original sealed up kept from corruption. This is, this is actually in reality what scholars did when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you know where they found them? They found a very arid area of the world, the caves of Qumran, hardly no rain whatsoever, very dry atmosphere. But sometime between the days of Malachi and Jesus, these Essenes, this sort of mystical sect of, of uh, Judaism, wrote out large portions, maybe even all of the Old Testament, wrote them on scrolls. You know what they did with them? They sealed them inside of earthen vessels. They put them in clay jars. That's what they did. And when these were discovered in the 1940s, scholars and, and Bible archaeologists and people like that just, I mean, they fell all over themselves. They were amazed at the preservation of these documents. They were in such amazing shape. After some 2,000 years of just being out there in a jar, they were sealed and preserved from corruption. And God seals up the vision and the prophecy. Why? To preserve it from corruption or destruction. I'm going to show you what that means in a minute. John 3.33, He that received his testimony has said to his seal that God is true. You know what the testimony of God is? This book right here. And I believe that this book is sealed and preserved from corruption or destruction. You can't destroy the Word of God. John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. The Son of Man is sealed. You know why? Number one, he's preserved. He's waiting in store. But number two, he's free from corruption. Do you know that when they laid the body of Jesus in the tomb for two days, on the third day he rose again? Did you know that during that time, the Bible says that the Lord would not allow his body to see corruption? You know what God did? God sealed him. So that he could not be corrupted. Now Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what happened is God seals his word, and in that he's saying, there cannot any corruption touch my word. And I believe that we have the very true words of God in this Bible, that since God has sealed them, they are totally free from any corruption whatsoever. Whew, I like this. 2 Timothy 2.16 But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past, and overthrow the faith of some. Now I'm going to stop right here. 
he mentions the, the words of Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus and Philetus have words that will eat away as a canker. Canker is cancer. Cancer is that which corrupts and destroys. It kills. And it takes good, healthy tissues that are in the body and corrupts them so that the host dies. It's literally just eaten up from the inside out. They have erred saying that the resurrection has passed already. In other words, their words, Dan Brown talked about the lost word of Freemasonry. Their word is corrupt and it corrupts everything it gets in contact with. That's what their word does. It eats as a canker. But then he says, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So he's given the contrast here. He said the words of Hymenaeus and Philetus, they are corrupt, they'll eat as a canker. But God has sealed up his words and the testimony of God, the foundation of God, has a seal on it. And no one can corrupt it because I've sealed it. I've stuck it in that jar. I burped the lid and everything's now going to be as... And I tell you, when I read this Bible, it's as fresh as when the first time God wrote it. That's absolutely amazing to me. Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. And I saw another angel sent from the east, having the seal of the living God, and cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. I love it. I love it. Hath God cast away his people? No, that's what Paul said. God didn't cast away Israel, not permanently. They're laid up in store. They're, they're waiting for a certain time when God's going to take them. And he's going to give them the seal of the Holy Ghost. And that seal, and he's going to put it where? In their foreheads. I want you to think about this. Because there is another mark that is in the foreheads of those who follow the beast. Remember, Lucifer has sealed up the sum. The sum total of all iniquity, the sum total of all sinners, fall at the feet of the Antichrist. And so here we have this, this seal being sealed on the foreheads of the 144,000 Jews, and they're from all 12 tribes of Israel. And so the sealing means that they cannot be corrupted. They cannot be destroyed. They cannot be taken away. That's what that sealing represents. Now, we're going we're gonna to compare Scripture with Scripture. We're going to see the significance of the great seal and what it represents and what it has in store for people who are living in the last day. So we have the name of God, or excuse me, the seal of God in the foreheads of the 144,000. Now let's go to Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I got it. This is so cool. The 144,000 are sealed in their foreheads, and that seal is their father's name. Who is their father? God. They have been born again. All right? That's what it's teaching. Jesus said, you generation of vipers. Paul talked to a man by the name of false prophet and called him a son of Belial. So who was his father? Lucifer. So they, and in Revelation 13, I'm, boy, I don't want to leave this one out. In Revelation 13, that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And they take the mark and it represents the name of the beast or the number of his name and it's in their forehead. When people take this mark, they are sealed and it's irreversible and it cannot be changed or altered 
That's how it's going to be. And God is going to take every one of those who have that seal, that mark on them, cast them into the lake of fire. But he is going to preserve without possibility of corruption or decay or destruction those who have been sealed with their father's name in their foreheads. Well, that's beautiful, isn't it? Now, I'm going to show you. There's actually a picture of this that God drew in the Bible for our understanding. I want you to notice the language of the King James Bible. Ezekiel 9.2, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Ezekiel 9.4, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And then in verse 5, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Now, let me explain what, what's going on here in Ezekiel. Go read Ezekiel 8. What you'll find is that God was showing Ezekiel that there was spiritual wickedness in high places going on inside the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the closer that Ezekiel got to the, the very sanctuary of the temple, the closer that God showed him the, the great abominations that were inside that temple. Every time God would show him this, look at this abomination, Ezekiel, oh, that's terrible. God says, come inside here, I've got something even worse than that. Oh, Lord, that's bad. Ezekiel, come through this little hole in the wall here. Crawl through there, I'm going to show you something even worse than that. He gets to the sanctuary of the temple. And there are the, the elders of Israel in there with all manner of four-footed creatures upon the walls. And they were worshiping uh, the beast is what they were doing. God said, see that? Now, here's what I'm going to do. And so this is where ev uh, ev evolution, Ezekiel 9, I was thinking of Revelation. Ezekiel 9 comes into play here. God said, there's still some good people here, Ezekiel. They're good people. They see what's going on. They're powerless to do anything about it. And they cry for the abominations that are in Israel. He said, these are my people. And there's a man with a writer's ink horn, basically just, just like the, the horn of a ram that they held ink in. And he had a pen. And he said, Ezekiel, have him go through and put a mark on the forehead of every man that sigheth and cries for the abominations in Israel. And you other guys with your swords, you go through, you start in the house of God first, because that's where judgment begins. And he said, you go and you slay and kill every man that you find except those who have the seal of God in their foreheads, the mark of the writer's inkhorn. I want you to ponder that for a little bit. Because that is showing God's preservation to the 144,000 while he literally destroys everybody else around them. And I think that this seal has something to do with that. When we go to Revelation chapter 9, verse 3, There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So think about it. This is exactly what we saw in Ezekiel chapter 9. God's going to seal the 144,000. He's going to put that, the, his name, their father's name on their foreheads. And then he's going to release, because there's some things sealed up down in the pit, He's going to release them out of the pit, and they're going to go around, and they're going to hurt men all over the earth for five months, except those who have the seal. You can think of it like this. In the days of the Passover, uh, whoever had a house there sealed that house with what? The blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb went on the doorpost and upon the lintel, and the destroying angel went through, and when that saw the blood... He did not go into the house and kill the firstborn child in there. He couldn't. Why? They were, as long as they were in the house, 
they were sealed from the destroyer. Think of what Abaddon and Apollyon means, Revelation 9, 11, the king of the bottomless pit, Abaddon and destroyer. But if you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise inside the house where the blood is the seal, you'll not be destroyed. You'll have eternal life. Now, this is what I think is neat. Because here's what God said. This is sort of an idea of what this seal represents as far as what's on the forehead of the 144,000. Deuteronomy chapter 6. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. He's talking about his words. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets, where? Right here, between thine eyes. Here is, you, I'll do it like this, okay? Here is the seal of God right here. His Father's name written in their foreheads. By the way, the, this part of your brain is the frontal lobe. This is where you ought to make all your decisions at, okay? It's where all the critical stuff goes on that you decide. I have decided to follow Jesus. That, that took place right here, all right? So you have between your eyes the Word of God, the seal of God, is right there between your eyes. Now, re remember, God speaks plainly in words and concrete, static ideas that never change and cannot be corrupted. All these over here speak in how? Symbols. Um, triangles with funny things on the inside of them, like this here. The all-seeing eye capstone on top of the pyramid. In other words, it's a symbol with no words. This is the revealed word of God. Masonry speaks of the lost word of God. This is pronounced plainly and understood plainly. Make it plain upon tables. This no man understands. God also promised the people that broke his law that he would send a nation to them from the very far reaches of heaven. And it would be a nation whose language they wouldn't understand. They wouldn't know the secret of their language. You think about that. I think that this has everything to do with God sealing up the sum of iniquity in the last days. And I think it's coming one of these days. Revelation 13, 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. So here's, here's the, the mark of the beast. It's the number of his name or his name. And it's sealed right where the word of God is supposed to be. Right here. And here's, here's the word of God for people. It's in our minds, in our hearts always. And the opposite of that is the unspoken symbolic word that's in the foreheads. The name of the beast or the number of his name it's in the foreheads of all people. And just as God seals the 144,000 and preserves them from corruption and destruction, God also is sealing those who take the mark of the beast. And here's what God is going to do to them. Revelation 14, 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out, without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and who receiveth the mark of his name. So remember, just as God seals his people with that Holy Spirit of promise and the word of God, this Father's name written in their foreheads, He's sealing unto condemnation those who take that mark. All of this is going to happen one day. But for right now, these things are sealed up. 
and it awaits someone who has the worthiness to open the seals and to take everything that it's bound up here and loose it and put it in force. Who is that? Revelation 5, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I am someone, I have, I've, I've been preaching the gospel now for years. But I can tell you, years of experience and based upon what I see in the scriptures, every good sermon that I've ever preached didn't come from me. Because I'm not worthy. I know I'd like to stand before people and I say, take your Bibles and turn to this and I'm going to show you something in the Word of God. But the truth of it is, I personally am not worthy to open this book and to show anybody what's in there. That belongs solely to the Lord Jesus Christ. He and He alone is worthy to loose the seals that are on this book and to open them up for our understanding. So this is what we're going to do. As we go through all of these symbols, the eagle, the pyramid, the number of stones that's in the pyramid, the number of arrows that's in the eagle's claw, and everything about it, we're going to examine it from the light of those who incorporated the symbols to begin with to see what they have to say about it. But remember, they're going to conceal the real truth about it. They're going to speak of it in allegories and symbols, but they're going to conceal it. In other words, they're going to put a seal on it and hope nobody opens it. But there is one who is worthy to loose those seals and open it up. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for everything that we see here, the eagles, we're going to study eagles out of the Bible. The arrows, we're going to find out what arrows mean. The olive branch, the stars, we're going to find out what that means. The so number 13, Bible. The stones that make up this pyramid, we're going to understand it from the Bible. This all-seeing eye and the new world order, we're going to let Jesus unseal this for us so we can find out the secret of the seal. I promise you, God's going to show you something from this book and you'll know it to be the truth. I'm looking forward to this study. You pray for me as we get into this and pray that God would give us light. This is Pastor Mike. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.